It's in your email. It's been in your email for a month, weekly. So that's like what four times a month. So please continue to to check in on that. We're not visual learners, but you can read. You're literate. It's not a learning thing. A uh, couple of things I will highlight today, though, for the non-visual learners, if you're more verbal. Uh, we do have an upcoming baptism uh, in a number of weeks. I don't think we've set a specific date for that yet, but if um, you or maybe one of your kids has not been baptized and you sense that the Lord is uh, calling you to that at this time, please let one of the elders know, and uh, we'll set a date here shortly, but we are uh, planning for that. Operation Christmas Child is accepting donations for postage, so you'll notice in the lobby. There's two things going on in the lobby right now, at least that I saw. Uh, one, we have necklaces from Uganda, so you can pay for those, and that will... Earrings and necklaces. Do you want to model that? No. no. The, um, so there are some sales going for Uganda, um, and that will be helpful. And also there is a book sale um, over on the desk. And the book sale, um, the money from the book sale will go towards the postage for Operation Christmas Child. Jillian, is there anything else that needs to be said about that? Okay. So please uh, support both of those um, this afternoon. Uh, the camping trip is still on for November 5th through 7th, but the location has changed. Um, the, uh, they, they, had, they had a canceled event that got rescheduled on our date, and so we are headed to Camp Blue Ridge, which is in Montebello. And if you have any questions about that, that will also be in the upcoming email. It was on the announcements this morning. And if you have any questions, I can point you to Jim Foster and to your grow. Of course, Jim, you're the only one in the room right now. York is in Sunday school, so you are the man to field questions about accommodations and that sort of thing. But we're still on for the camping trip for the guys and the boys on November 7th, or November 5th through the 7th. We'll be in the lobby after, after the service with the sign-up sheet. All right, so Jim will be out there. Uh, do sign up for that so we know what to plan on for food. A um, couple other quick announcements. Grace Christian School had a very successful weekend of sports. Uh, the boys' soccer team went to their state thing, and I think they were third place in VACA. I heard that the semifinal game was exceptionally good. I think that took two overtimes and penalty kicks. Uh, and so we, we were on the uh, losing side of that and then won the next day for the consolation. Uh, Patrick and Clark were both pulled up from the eighth grade to play varsity. Uh, uh, so they were part of that team. So, fellas, congratulations uh, to you all. Uh, cross country continues to dominate with girls, but I don't think we have any cross country runners uh, in our church right now. So I'll, I'll pass on that. But uh, Gary Hockman, Mary Grace, Lucy, and Molly, these girls, uh, well, and Gary's team, are undefeated still, and they just won their regionals and are headed to the district championships next week. Is that right, Mary Grace? States, States next week. So we can continue to cheer them on, but undefeated won in, uh, an exciting five sets yesterday. Uh, a nerve-wracking five sets. Why did it take five sets? <laughs> All right, so anyway, the school continuing to enjoy some excellence um, there. Before, uh, yeah, so congratulations. Uh, John, if you want to make your way up, I was going to um, introduce some first-time visitors. I know of some. Sarah, you're the, you've, you've brought quite the party, and why don't you introduce us to everything over there? <laughs> I'm Sarah Schwalter, now Sarah Brand. I grew up in the church. I'm Stan Christine's daughter. Um, so we had our, we got married last year, but had our celebration last night. So this is my husband, Justin Brand. Michael Bellman, Elizabeth Bellman, Danny Bellman, Nasa Hernandez, Jimmy Nagel, and Robbie Buster. Very good. Welcome. Which one is the husband? Put on next to her, Justin. On her right shoulder. Mm -hmm. Does she say that? Mm -hmm. Say that. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to have to get a portable microphone for the crowd. Um, <laughs> any other first time visitors today? Yes. Go ahead and stand up and introduce yourself. Um, my name is Autumn Quinn. Um, I go to Mary Baldwin. So. Very good. Autumn, it's good to have you. Thank you. 
Good to have you with us. Anybody else for the first time? Yes, sir. Um, Dan, um, go to Blue Room. All right, very good. Dan, welcome, it's good to have you. All right, John. We'd like to just pray briefly for Bob and Helen Turner. Both uh, the Turners are in the hospital right now, and uh, they're still doing some testing with uh, Bob to find out what's going on with him. And uh, Helen uh, just has had some challenges as well. So um, as of right now, they're both at uh, Augusta Health. But let's just pray for them real quickly, and then we'll move on. Father, we're thankful that... Um, you care about every aspect and every detail of our lives. Nothing is too small for you, nothing is too large. And as your people, we just lift our brother and sister Bob and Helen before you right now. Lord, we just pray that you would uh, just be with them. May your peace flood their inner being. And uh, Lord, just give the doctors wisdom to know how to best help them with some of their physical challenges. And Lord, we just uh, thank you that they belong to you. They're yours and they're perfectly secure in you. And we just ask that you would uh, just draw them uh, very intimately into your arms right now and just care for them in, in every way we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We got um, something a little different this morning we want to share with you in terms of an announcement. And uh, we uh, didn't know the best way to communicate this. We'll send out an email to everybody um, after we finish with this announcement this morning that uh, others that couldn't be here. But um, in recent weeks, we were made aware that um, Augusta County has decided to sell the old Beverly Manor Elementary School that's located uh, just off the Stanton Loop, Route 262 uh, on Cedar Green Road. It's out next to uh, Beverly Manor uh, Middle School. And um, our church and school leadership uh, was encouraged by some different folks to go take a look at it. And um, we shared about this in our Wednesday night, last Wednesday night prayer meeting. I think some of us were kind of like, okay, we'll go look. Um, but we're not wildly enthusiastic about it. But in any case, uh, we, a number of us, toured the facility and the 20 acres that it's located on. And um, just as an initial step to saying, well, Lord, is this something you might have for us in the church? The, um, the building is quite large. Uh, it has a full-size gymnasium, and it has uh, athletic fields and uh, some uh, room for expansion. It has outdoor playgrounds. Um, and uh, while it needs some cosmetic work, we're told by a civil engineer that it looks like it's in pretty good shape structurally. Um, it is large enough that it could provide a single centralized location for Grace Christian School. Uh, and as I said, it's got a full-size gym and considerable auxiliary space as well. So uh, in this context, in terms of potential use by Community Fellowship Church, um, the location is easily accessible uh, just off the loop. Um, it has uh, more than adequate on-site parking right next to the building, um, which is something a number of CFC folks have expressed uh, a wish that we, we had here. Um, and so uh, it's uh, something that we think we need to carefully consider um, Derek, if you would, um, put that picture up, if you will. Um, well, I'm relieved that you're laughing. Uh, this, is, uh, this is put together by our very um, positive and enthusiastic head of school, Don Larson. Um, and uh, he superimposed Grace Christian School on there and the Grace logo and the, <laughs> the present Community Fellowship Church logo. So um, in any case, we, uh, we have not uh, purchased the property at this point. But 
Um, we um, felt like, um, well, let me let me back up a little bit. Um, as we toured the building and walked around and looked at it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we realized that Augusta County uh, had entered into a contract with some folks who wanted to buy the Verona Elementary School. And uh, the way that contract is set up is that they made an offer, um, Augusta County accepted it, but the offer included a contingency that allows this group to do a 60, uh, I'm sorry, a six month study period, careful research period. And during that time, the uh, county um, will not offer it to any other potential buyers um, and if this group decides they want it they will um, be able to purchase it for that uh, the, the price that they offered so uh, as we prayed about it and consulted together etc we felt that we should make an offer on this facility under the same uh, uh, qualifications and so we took the offer in two Wednesdays ago in a formal um, letter that was uh, put together with the help of an attorney and um, that night the Board of Supervisors met and they accepted our offer so um, I, I want to carefully qualify this we have a six-month study period that can also be extended by another 90 days that at any time we can say hey thank but no thanks and so this will allow us to carefully evaluate uh, whether or not this is something that we feel like the Lord wants us to do to count the cost so to speak and again I want to repeat that this is not a binding contract but it takes the building off the market the county has agreed to sell it to us um, if we decide that we want to um, pull the trigger on it so to speak and go ahead with the purchase Consistent with our history over 40 plus years uh, in terms of buildings, um, we have always tried to um, combine our buildings for use by both the school and the church to make the most of the square footage that's represented in the buildings that God has graciously allowed us to own. And of course, this fits that bill, so to speak, in terms that it would potentially uh, centralize not only the school's location location but would also um, make a nice home for the church with lots of parking that's easily accessible for most people outside of the downtown area you actually get to this place sooner less time because there are no stoplights depending on where you live and so it's it's a very convenient um, location Um, again, this will take a lot of careful research and cost counting, um, especially appreciative to uh, Jimmy Harper, I don't know if Jimmy's in the room, to uh, Ray Burkholder, one of our school parents, um, to Don Larson and other uh, folks that are kind of leading the way with this. Um, we, uh, we live in rapidly changing times where the flow of mainstream culture is increasingly opposing orthodox Christianity and even becoming hostile to people of faith. Um, we believe that it's for such a time as this that God has called us as a church and as a school and um, we just believe that very possibly this is God's provision for us in moving ahead into the future and again we're going to carefully count the cost and pray and um, you know while there's lots of things we could be fearful about the economy how's it going to hold up what's uh, our government going to do with ministries like Grace Christian School and even uh, Community Fellowship Church as in the Virginia Values Act that um, I won't go into right now but it's it's an uncertain time and yet if this is what God is calling us as a church to do we don't want to shrink back um, and if this property would help better equip us to serve the cause of God's kingdom in the days ahead we want to move ahead boldly by faith in this 
So, um, question that I'll pose for us, and I'd like for us to talk, uh, we would like to talk about this more as a family, and that is, what legacy will those of us who are in my generation, and those of you here who are in my generation, what legacy um, will we pass on to the next generation? And one question that I think about is, uh, how can my generation hand off the baton with something like this or the buildings that we currently have, uh, if that's God's will for us just to hold on to them? How, how can we pass the baton on so that the next generation has something to move forward with? And then the second question, of course, is will the next generation step up and take the baton and run with the ball? Um, I'm not going to go into it. I've written some papers on this and shared them with the church. Um, we can't overstate just the seriousness of our times and how things are rapidly changing. We can't overstate that. So we have to ask the question, is this God's calling for us at this particular point in carrying the torch forward, so to, to speak? We... Um, we would not do anything, make any kind of decision on this until we've had lots of time to have plenty of input from the CFC family. We'll be scheduling uh, several times probably when we can open the facility up and let you go out and take a look at it and walk through it. And uh, we will have special times of prayer and we will have uh, opportunities to, to have a, a conversation about this with you, the larger church. And we want to make sure that we get uh, carefully get your input on this. So we're trusting God in the context of Proverbs 16 where uh, the writer says, commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. And the mind of man plans his way but the Lord directs his steps. Uh, any decision like this that we've made in the past we pray, we wait we ask God to give us a sense of what seems good and then we step out in faith. And we're not saying that we feel like this is God's will, but we're just before him right now waiting to see what he would say to uh, us about this. Um, we will be announcing this to the GCS staff tomorrow and then to the GCS parents on um, Tuesday. So um, just kind of keep it close to yourselves right now, and then the information will be out to our larger faith community no later than this past or this next Tuesday. We're going to um, call for a special day of uh, fasting and prayer, not this Wednesday, but Wednesday a week. That is the Wednesday of our regular monthly prayer meeting, in this case our November prayer meeting. We'd like to ask you to consider fasting on Wednesday for however long during the day or whatever meals, the whole day, whatever, as you feel uh, led to do, and come together with us on Wednesday a week to pray about this, but also so um, a number of folks, um, and you're well aware of this, are dealing with some serious illnesses. And um, you know, I don't think in my memory there's ever been a time in our church when we've had as, as many um, challenges in this, this aspect of our, our lives, um, cancer and some other uh, serious sicknesses. We'd, we'd like to also... Uh, anoint those folks with oil next Wednesday and pray for their healing. So this is serious, serious stuff, and we need we need your participation. So join us Wednesday week for prayer. For newbies, what time? Uh, seven o'clock for newbies, and uh, seven o'clock for oldies. So, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, John and Brian and Brian, is there anything else that I didn't share about this that I should share? John, how many classrooms? Um, more than I can count. The, um, the square footage represents about, uh, Jimmy says, about 10% more square footage than all of our buildings combined right now. 
so it's good size. And the fact that it has a full-size gymnasium is significant, uh, not just for the school. Um, it's, I think, the only elementary school in Augusta County that had a full-size gymnasium, and it's got some large utility areas, and it's got dedicated areas for art and that type of thing. It actually, it actually would have a room for chorus as well. So, All right, I will take a few questions. I, I want to be sensitive to time, but uh, Charles Jackson. Well, what's the potential? Is there good potential for selling this building on the market? God knows. <laughs> We have one group that would uh, already has expressed interest in the Statler complex. Uh, they told us if we ever wanted to sell it, let them know, and they seem interested at this point. Uh, I would say from a commercial standpoint, um, I would think um, at, at this time that this building would be certainly be attractive. We, we have new roofs on all of our buildings. We have a lot of new HVAC in most of our buildings. God has enabled us to do um, uh, that kind of improvement over the years and uh, has provided so yeah we, we would have to sell this building and that complex and probably hold on to the activity center so think about this pray about it if you have questions you can email us call us uh, don't text us and uh, you know just um, Let's be in prayer about this. This is exciting. And I would say to those of you who are oldies, um, you know, guys, uh, let's be Caleb's and Joshua's. Okay? Joe, Joe um, spoke up in the prayer meeting this morning. God wants to use all generations. And this retirement mindset is, it's not welcome here. <laughs> So you guys uh, who are my generation, let's cross the finish line running, okay? And let's do everything we can to pass the baton to the next generation. If they drop it, that's on them. <laughs> so. All right, I, my notes are uh, shorter this morning than they usually are, depending on how extemporaneous I get. But um, I feel like this is an important message, uh, concluding message in this series on sanctification, um, a much neglected topic. And I'm going to share a doctrine this morning that was common in the early church that you seldom hear about today. And um, uh, I just want you to hear me out before you throw stones at me because this could be easily misunderstood, some of what I'm going to share. But I think we need to hear this. And uh, so pray with me, if you will, and let's share God's Word together. Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, please give us eyes to better understand the reality of sanctification as our healing as persons in Christ. Help us to better appreciate and practically cooperate with this glorious calling in our lives. In Christ we pray. Amen. Um, all right, as soon as I figure out which button to push, there we go. We're talking about sanctification. And the theme scripture that we've utilized is uh, 2 Peter 2, 24 through 25. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. So last week I emphasized that this healing process administered by the Holy Spirit is intended to restore us to whole, healthy personhood, if I can use that word, in the image of God who as Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is ultimately personal. 4th century church father Gregory of Nyssa wrote, For that which he, Christ, has not assumed, he has not healed. But that which is united to his godhood is also saved or healed. And this statement flows out of Peter's words that we have been considering now for a number of weeks in 2 Peter 1, 4. He 
has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. So these are stunning words, I believe, especially to our 21st century ears. And they really are the words that stimulated me some months ago to dig deeper into this concept of our union with Christ and uh, this whole concept of this aspect of salvation that we call sanctification. And that's really what this, this verse has led up to this series of messages that I've, I've shared. So by virtue of causing us to be born again, by making us partakers of His divine nature, bringing us into actual personal union with Himself. Christ has assumed our humanity in order to heal us into healthy persons in His image as the fundamental goal of our salvation. First century church father Arrhenius said it like this, God the Logos became what we are in order that we may become what he himself is. Amen. Dangerous statement. Needs some qualification. But wait till you see this next statement. By Athanasius. I thought maybe, maybe I won't share this because it's so easily misunderstood, but sorry. Athanasius said, God became man so that man could become God. So this sounds almost blasphemous to our 21st century minds. But I need to emphatically point out that these early fathers did not mean that we humans or followers of Jesus Christ actually become God. That is not what they meant. Rather, they meant what Peter states, that we become participants in the divine nature while remaining creatures in relationship to the Creator. They never meant to suggest that the distinction between God and man was ever eliminated. But they were in the language of their day, and this is the key, they were emphasizing this marvelous union between man and God grounded in what Peter refers to back in 2 Peter 1 as precious and magnificent promises in which Paul observes, he says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Peter adds things into which angels long to look. Our salvation and what Christ has purchased for us in relationship with himself is so stunning that human language can't wrap itself around these incredible truths. So, um, Irenaeus, Athanasius, numerous other early church fathers, first century, especially through the fourth century, but all the way up to uh, the Reformation, Calvin and Luther said this also in, in various forms. But they called this, um, this concept of human participation in the divine nature, the born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, our hope of glory, Jesus Christ in us, our hope of glory. They actually had a name for this, this doctrine, which they called theosis. And another word that they used was deification. Now this really sounds blasphemous, doesn't it? But you have to understand what they were saying back then. These terms or this doctrine meant being penetrated by divinity, becoming partakers of the divine nature, yet while remaining fully human as the creatures God always intended us to be as created in His image. And so these early fathers saw salvation not merely in terms of our justification, justification, but as the process of restoring us to the image of God through the sanctifying process of deification as I've defined it and the image of God as I defined it last week or tried to define it. Now here's a, here's a statement that I think is profound. Andrew uh, Louth, L-O-U-T-H, Louth, let's call it Louth, said what the early fathers envisaged through deification, through sanctification, is a transformation 
transformation, a transfiguration of human beings. These are big words, but what is actually or certainly meant is a real change, a change that is a result of coming to share in the life of God. This change involves a kind of reconstitution of our humanity, a reshaping, a straightening out of all the distortions and corruptions that we have brought upon our humanity by misusing, abusing our human capacities, and by living out our lives in accordance with values and principles that fall a long way short of the values and principles inherent in creation as God intended it. In other words, by His stripes we are healed. This is largely what the sanctifying process is about. And this should be a primary vision we have for the reality of our salvation here and now. J.I. McGuckin observes, and I, I think this is profound also, for the early church, salvation, therefore, was more than the forgiveness of sins, rather a profound reworking of ordinary humanity into a divinely graced life form that would experience an ongoing transformation into God's image. of this concept of sanctification as an essential facet of our salvation. John Calvin, and this was, what, 15th century? Whatever, I get my centuries mixed up. 15th or 16th, 1500s or 1600s, I think it was the 1500s. Calvin said, Christ contains both justification and sanctification inseparably in himself. You cannot possess him, Christ, without being made partaker in his sanctification, deification, because he cannot be divided into pieces. Again, quoting and paraphrasing Loth, he says, Deification, participating in the divine nature, sanctification, is not a negating of our humanity by making us into many gods, but the fulfillment of what it is to be human. Deification reveals the divine and lofty purpose for which humankind was created. So the emphasis is that this is the full scope a biblical salvation. And if we miss this grand vision, then we have reduced salvation, reductionism, to merely a shallow form of fire insurance that saves us from hell and provides our ticket to heaven, thus short-circuiting and cheapening the full extent of what Christ accomplished at Calvary. Is this a problem? Has it been a problem in the evangelical culture in the United States? I think so. I, I have a deep conviction, though, and have had for some time, the Holy Spirit is restoring the greater scope of truth about our salvation to the church. Not just here in community fellowship, but to the American church. And a lot of what's going on in this culture, a lot of the quote-unquote bad things that are going on, if that wakes the church up, if that causes us to run and seek after the Lord that much more passionately, then it's a good thing for the church. The sifting, the shaking that's taking place, if it helps motivate the church to run more passionately after the Lord, then it is a good thing. I think that God is restoring the full meaning of our salvation through the sanctifying process to the church today. Well, one final comment about this concept of our participating in the divine nature, this concept of deification, before I move toward a conclusion in the series of message. A Russian theologian by the name of Vladimir Karlamov observes, while the concept of theosis, deification, in the modern world, that's us, is objectionable or controversial to some, when we move to the world of the fourth century, back during the day of Athanasius, the issue and language of theosis is not alien, either for the intellectually elite or the common people. 
the concept of theosis had become a matter of popular Christian theology back in the 4th century, perhaps resembling in its practical application the born-again evangelical theology of today. That is, as the born-again emphasis has characterized our American evangelical culture, the Billy Graham uh, crusade, you must be born again, a wonderful anointing of the Holy Spirit on that man who led many of us to Christ who are in this room. Nevertheless, things got a bit out of balance because back in the 4th century, the emphasis upon deification and sanctification was as common to them in the early church as, as the born again mentality is to us today. Now think about that. And I think that's the challenge about God's Word. As disciples of Jesus Christ, are we going to stay in our groove, so to speak? Or are we going to allow this to constantly challenge us to move into greater depths of truth and reality than maybe you know, our culture, even our evangelical culture, is comfortable with? So here's, here's a question that I have asked myself and I will ask you. Uh, how amenable or willing are we to being challenged to move outside of our little evangelical box into the larger council of Scripture? I tell you, when this truth becomes a settled conviction with us, it has an utterly life-changing impact in our thinking and faith practice. So my prayer for myself and for you in this church is that the Holy Spirit will convict us of our need to press in to know God and to cooperate fully with this sanctifying work in our lives. So in the short time remaining this morning, let me emphasize, yeah, the short time remaining. Yes, thank you, Joe. In the short time remaining, but specifically, let me emphasize um, the essential nature of God's healing is sanctifying work and conforming us to His image. What is it to look like in the most practical terms that I can muster this morning? We said last week, very simple message, God is personal. And it's like, well, we know that. But do we really know that? God is personal. And um, He has created us to be persons in His image. God is personal. He has created us to be personal in His image. And we consider how that impacts us, um, not only as individual persons created in His image, but also how it impacts us in the essential fabric of our relationships with one another. Uh, I, I'd encourage you to get notes from that message or listen to it, go on our internet and access it. It's, it's such an important foundation, even though it's so simple, um, it's profound. And I'd encourage you to, to listen to that to make better sense out of what I'm sharing this morning. So in the context of the personal, Peter writes, Since by your obedience to the truth through the Holy Spirit you have purified your hearts for the sincere affection of the brethren, see that you love one another fervently from a pure heart. You've been regenerated, born again, not from a mortal origin seed, sperm, this is the amplified version, but from one that is immortal by the ever-living and lasting Word of God. That, that verse has been just resonating with me for some time now. Uh, Peter's saying that we're to love one another fervently, that is intently, strenuously, earnestly, to be hot even to the point of boiling in our love. Is this normal Christianity or is this for uh, a few spiritual elites? I want to ask you a question that I'm asking myself. How radical is the love of God at work in your life, in you and through you right now? How radical is it? What is, what is the primary thing that, that drives and motivates you and me? And, and how radical is our love for one another? I appreciate the, the legend about the Apostle John 
when he was old and feeble being carried on the shoulders of the young men and about the only thing he could say was love one another love one another love one another he had just reduced it down how how is it that he had reduced it down i mean peter says um I left this verse out. Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. So Peter, Paul, John, Jesus himself, our Lord, uh, they do not pull this concept of radical love out of thin air. It's the very nature of who God is. God is love. And if we are born of his seed and nature, that fervent love will characterize our relationships with one another. The big word that I will use is ontology. It's, it's a word worth knowing. In, in certain contexts, you can use it. It helps communicate something better than just using the word reality. But the ontology or reality of God is that he is love. Love is not an attribute that describes God. Love is not an adjective that describes love. God is love. Okay? And this is important for us. The ground of all reality is God. And the ground of all reality is God is love. When we have eyes to see, you are created in God's image. And you are created to be in the image of God's love as an individual and as a social being. And so I don't think we can get any more fundamental in our theology. I mean, we, we, we can appreciate John being carried around on the shoulders of the young men, assuming that's true, saying, love one another, love one another, love one another. What is more essential than loving one another in such a radical manner? So how radically committed to one another are we to be? Let's see. How radically committed is the Father to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, to the other two? How radically committed is their love? Whose image we're to reflect? Oh. I told Brian I was going to share the scripture. Um, he shared it earlier. Uh, when we talk about communion, which we have tried over the years recently to emphasize, communion is remembrance and proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. But communion is also primarily about communion, which is why it's called communion. <laughs> It's, it's about we are one with Christ and he is one with us and we are one with one another. If you're one with Christ, how one are you with one another? And what is your relationship with one another? Whoever one another is. I mean, you look around the room, that's the best definition we can give this morning for one another. Okay? So how radical is our love for one another? dangerous word, radical. John Calvin, I mean, anybody knows that if John Calvin said it, it's right. <laughs> right? I disagree with Calvin on some things, but he doesn't really care. <laughs> but John Calvin said, just as believers have a vertical participation in the body and blood of Christ, they simultaneously have a horizontal participation in the church as body. Yes. And American evangelicals just go floating all over the place don't like the drums, so let's go someplace else. Worship's too loud, let's go someplace else. Worship's not lively enough, let's go someplace else. 
They don't have chandeliers that we can swing from. They don't sing enough hymns, etc., 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 etc. I'm not saying there aren't good reasons to, to, you know, you need to be where God wants you to be, but come on, American evangelicals. Let's get with it. That's not in my notes. <laughs> So um, John writes, um, yeah, J. Todd Billings, quote, I don't want to pass over this, it's impossible to participate in Christ through the Lord's Supper in an exclusively vertical direction. Participation in Christ simply must involve the horizontal activity of koinonia and love. And it's not just when we take the elements, it's how we live. It's how we live. If I may stop at this point, Rod Dreher wrote the book, The Benedict Option. And he said, in a culture increasingly hostile to Christ, you know what the witness of God is going to be? It's going to be pockets of Christian community where people actually love each other in this radical manner and stand for truth without compromise. And he said lots of other things, but I think, I think he nailed it. So when you get these concepts, you understand what John said in, in his first letter, uh, 1 John. He wasn't just saying a nice, a nice, warm, fuzzy, sweet things about love. I mean, he was talking about the ontology of God, the reality of God. He said, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God because they're not, like Peter said, born of some mortal thing. They're born of the Spirit of God. And that's who God is. The one who does not love does not know God. For God is love. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has beheld God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. In other words, people see the reality of God in us. It's not going to be because we got all the right doctrine, although that's important and necessary. It's going to be because they see God's love in us. And if God's love is not in us, we miss something. And we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God. And God abides in Him. By this, love is perfected with us, that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as He is the ontology of God, so also are we the ontology of God in us, the reality of God in us, in this world. We love because He first loved us. Last page. God is personal. If we were to sum up his essential nature in one word, it would be agape, love. Therefore, the chief end in sanctification, what is sanctification to look like? It's look, to look like agape. And agape represents the healing of our human person into conformity with the reality of who God is, His image. I quoted essayist Thomas Wolfe several weeks ago as describing the chief aspect of man's sin-inflicted disease as alienation and loneliness. That is, alienation from God and the sense of deep existential loneliness in our disconnectedness connectedness from others. Uh, and, and Wolf painted a, a very bleak picture of this alienation and loneliness. But look how he finishes up that same essay. He said, Christ says, I am my father's son and you are my brothers. And the unity that binds us all together that makes us a family, brothers and sons of God, is love. The central purpose of Christ's life is to destroy the life of loneliness and to establish here on earth the life of love. Then he says, through love to destroy the walls of loneliness forever and even if the evil and unrighteous of this earth shall grind them down into the dust yet if they bear all things meekly and with love they will enter into a fellowship of joy a brotherhood of love such as no man or men on earth ever knew before such was the final intention of Christ's life yeah. 
in the days ahead, Christianity ain't going to make it just based on Sunday morning attendance and being good religious people. It's going to be radical Christian community, radical love for those who are serious about following Jesus Christ. May God help me. May God help us in that respect. So God's ultimate purpose in our salvation is not just to save us for heaven, but it's also to transform us into his image in this life as whole healthy persons characterized by selfless love for one another. Powerful and challenging verse, two verses from Paul in Philippians. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. The image of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit reflected in us. The ontology, the reality of God's Trinitarian being in whose image we are created. Our ultimate freedom. How many of us want to be free? All of us want to be free. All of us want to be happy. Our ultimate freedom and happiness is found then by being sanctified and healed from the sin-inflicted disease of self-centeredness into the wholeness of persons in God's image as expressed in these words by Paul. Here's another, I think, excellent observation. James Hitchcock says, one of the purposes of authentic Christianity is to take people out of themselves to provide them with the means to overcome self-centeredness and distorted self-love. That's the sickness of sin. And God wants to take us out of that where we are learning to love others, preferring others in love above ourselves. It is better to give than to receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive, Jesus said. And I don't think he was talking about Christmas presents. I think he was talking about a, a way of life. So this healing into healthy persons in God's image is the litmus of authentic Christianity. As John states, the one who does not love like this does not know God because God is love. You know, I'm, I'm 70 years old now, and I appreciate that all my knowledge and so-called accomplishments over the years are nothing but wood, hay, and stubble if they are apart from learning to walk in love. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, lots of noise and hot air apart from love. May God help each of us to understand and grow in what it means to be participants in the divine nature and to understand that it's only by our love for one another that the world will know that we are authentic Christians. This is the third time I've shared this quote by Craig Gay. Although we are surrounded by a great deal of talk about religious experience today and even by talk about God's presence in the world, we must insist that all such talk comes to naught as a genuine witness to God. God's otherness. That is, it comes to naught as a witness to the possibility of really knowing the living God unless it is accompanied by holiness, which is equated here with love. What are the two great commandments? To love the Lord our God with everything that we have, everything that we are. And the second, then, is to love one another. As love overtakes our lives, holiness flows forth. God's holiness flows forth. Holiness is not some moralistic, you know, undertaking by Christians. It is learning to be taken out of our self-centeredness into this kind of love where we are preferring one another above self. I can't make this happen. I can't even make it happen in my own life. But I'm glad I don't have to. The Holy Spirit is doing this. He is doing it. He's going to do it. And I think the big question is, will we yield ourselves to Him and allow Him to do this work in our lives? Will we be willing to let Him make Community Fellowship Church uh, a pocket in this increasingly anti-Christian culture of the love of God, the radical love of God? Father, 
thank you that you are able to do exceeding abundantly more than we can ask or think according to your power that works within us. We're not talking here about human ability. We're talking about the power of God. And I just, this, there's no question that this is what you're doing. There's no question that this is what you're going to do. The question is, will we cooperate with you? The question is, will we obey you? The question is, will we submit ourselves to you? The question is, will we come to you where we are and saying, I'm not there, Lord, but here I am. Take my life. Do what you have to do in me. Bring a wrecking ball, if necessary, to deliver me from holding on, clinging to the things that I think make for happiness or fulfillment. And bring me to a place where I will see that it's only in surrendering fully to you that I will find ultimate meaning, fulfillment, happiness in my life. Lord, only your Holy Spirit can do these things. And we just pray that you would continue to give us an increasing revelation in the true knowledge of Jesus Christ, that all of the baloney in this world that we hold on to will just fall away in its appeal to us, that the hooks that this world has in our lives will just be removed, and that we will be totally given in surrender to following you and to living for your purposes in this life. Pray this for each of us here this morning for this church in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, I have um, copies of most of what I shared on either side of the stage. Help yourselves. Um, come to the prayer meeting a week from Wednesday. Please be praying um, before that prayer meeting for some of the different ones that you know in this church who are struggling with illness and so on. And please be praying that God will make clear to us what we should do about this uh, building situation. Praise the Lord. We're dismissed, and if the fellows could take care of the chairs in the middle on the side, we'd really appreciate it. <laughs>